So I'll tell you another story. It's a personal story. It's not one that I share very often. And it profoundly changed the course of my life. In August of 2011, I had the opportunity to visit Afghanistan with the United States Air Force. I had done some work with the mobility forces. These are the people that fly the tankers and the cargo planes and Air Force One, all the big planes. And the general said to me, Simon, you've gotten to know us quite well. It would mean a lot to me if you would go to either Iraq or Afghanistan to see our men and women perform their mission. Would you be willing to go? So I said yes. They picked Afghanistan. Now, I didn't tell my parents where I was going because I didn't want them to worry. I told them I was going away with the Air Force, true. I told them I was going to be out of touch for a while because I was going to be on a lot of planes, true. I told them I was going to Germany, true. I just didn't tell them from Germany I was going to Afghanistan. <laughs> and I had no responsibility. I was simply going as an observer. I had two officers who were assigned to be my escorts. And we met basically for the first time uh, at Penn Station in Philadelphia, where we drove to Dover Air Force Base, where we would leave for Germany. We took a big C-5 cargo plane. In Germany, we changed planes, and we got on a KC-135 tanker built in 1956. I was on a plane built in 1956 <laughs> um, where we flew to Bagram. We landed in the middle of the night. We touched down, and the big door on the side of the plane had opened, but we hadn't gotten off the plane yet. We'd been on the, we'd been on the ground for maybe 10 minutes, and the base came under rocket attack. Three rockets hit 100 yards off our nose. This is how my trip began. Now, if you've ever been in a war zone, for those of you in the room who've ever been in a war zone, you, have, you know this. You have all the feelings you're supposed to have, you just don't have them at the right times. Weirdly, I was incredibly relaxed, and maybe that's because the people I was with were incredibly relaxed and I felt safe. We're eventually, the panic came later. We're eventually given the all clear, and we went to our housing. Now, the purpose of being in Afghanistan, we were going to be in the country for up to 30 hours, and the goal was to witness an airdrop mission. They're not regularly scheduled, so we had to find out if there was one as soon as we got there, and it turns out there was one first thing in the morning. So we got about two and a half hours, three hours of sleep, and we went and got on this airdrop mission, which was incredible. We sat in the back of a C-17. We flew about an hour and a half, two hours out to the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan. The plane dropped down to about 2,000 feet, the back door opened and we sat there and watched as cargo flew out the back so we could resupply an Army forward operating base. It was an amazing, amazing experience. We then flew back to Bagram and the goal was to come back home. There's no regularly scheduled flight, so we have to sort of find out what flights we can get on. It's always up to the discretion of the pilots. We found a flight that was leaving um, shortly after we got back and so we uh, asked the pilots, and they said, absolutely, we can join their flight. And we waited and waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And eventually, we got on the plane. We were all strapped in, literally five minutes from leaving. And the pilot walked up to us and said, I'm sorry, we need to bump you guys. We need to make more room for stretchers. It was carrying wounded warriors out of, out of theater, and they needed our space. If there's ever a good reason to get bumped off a plane, this was it. So we got off the plane, and we went to look for another flight. And that's when we found out there were no other flights until Tuesday, and this was only Saturday. I was gonna get stuck in Afghanistan for at least four days, maybe longer, because we don't know what we're gonna get on on Tuesday, and I have no way of telling my parents. They're not gonna hear from me on the date that I told them that I would get home. Immediately, every fiber of my being sank. And I remember becoming completely panicked and completely preoccupied with one thing, my happiness, my safety and my comfort. And I didn't care who had to go out of their way to get me what I wanted. I remember there was a public affairs officer who said, I can get you to Kyrgyzstan, but you don't have the right visa. And I looked at him and I said, you get me on that plane. I don't talk to people like that. And I could see myself becoming this person that I hated. Some of us in the room have worked for somebody in our careers who wants the next promotion and they don't care that they have to tie our turn our lives upside down so they can get what they want. I was becoming that person. We went back to our housing, 
and I lay down on the bed and closed my eyes. My mind was racing. I was convinced that there would be another rocket attack on the base. I was convinced that I was going to get hit. I was convinced that my parents were going to find out that I was in Afghanistan when an, arm, uh, an Air Force officer knocks on the door. I was convinced. Paranoia, fear, everything that you can imagine swept over me. One of the officers that I was traveling with said, I'm going to see if I can get us on another flight, and he left the room. The other officer, thinking I was asleep just because my eyes were closed, said, well, I'm going to go to the gym then, and he walked out and turned off the lights for me. I couldn't sleep. My mind was racing. All I wanted to do was get out of there. I regretted saying yes. I regretted being there. I didn't want to be there. I'm in the purpose business. I write and talk about this sense of why and sense of purpose in our lives. So I started to remind myself, Simon, you need a purpose. You don't have a purpose. You need a purpose. So I started inventing one. You're here to tell their story. It worked for like a few minutes, and then it would slide back into my fear and panic again. And I realized what was happening to me is I was living the equivalent of an unfulfilled life compressed into 24 hours. I had an amazing day. I got to see something that most people will never get to see in their entire lives, except I didn't want to wake up and do it again the next day. And I think many of us do the same thing. We, com we confuse moments of happiness with joy and fulfillment. We confuse winning a piece of business, getting a promotion, getting an award, getting recognition, doing well on a test with actual deep fulfillment. Those experiences are wonderful, but happiness is fleeting. There's not a single person in this room, absolutely zero, who's walking around with an amazing sense of accomplishment for that test that you aced a year ago. <laughs> that feeling is gone. Fulfillment is something entirely different. It's something you carry with you on a daily basis, whether you're enjoying the day or not. It's like loving your family. You may not like your family every day, but you love your family every day. One is fleeting, the other is lasting. And this is what was happening to me. I'd realized that I had this amazing day and I was confusing happiness and fulfillment. And so I gave up, I lay in that bed paranoid, scared, and depressed, and I literally gave up. I decided that if I was going to get stuck here, I might as well make myself useful. And so I decided I was going to volunteer. I would speak anywhere they wanted me to speak. I would carry boxes and sweep floors. All I wanted to do was serve some of those amazing people that I'd met on this trip. I wanted to serve those who served others. And instantly, this incredible calm came over me. I was even excited. This is what fulfillment means. It's not the fleeting joys that we may experience. It's not the accomplishments that we achieve. It's the opportunity to serve those who serve others. And upon making this realization, I had nothing but joy and calm and excitement and peace. It was like a movie. The timing was uncanny. Upon making this amazing realization, the door flung open and it was Major Throckmorton. He said, I got us on a flight. There's been a flight that's been redirected, but we have to go now. We have to go now. If we don't leave now, they're going to leave without us. Where's Matt? I said, he's at the gym. So we ran to the gym. We got him off the treadmill. And we ran back. No time to shower. He put his uniform back on. We grabbed all our stuff, and we ran out to the flight line. When we got out to the flight line, we could see the plane we were going to go. We were going to take home. See, big C-17, it was sitting right out there on the tarmac. And as soon as we got there, a security cordon came down and they wouldn't let us out to the plane. Because somewhere else on base, they were having a fallen soldier ceremony. And out of respect, when they have the fallen soldier ceremony, everything stops. And so, so we, we sat on the curb and waited. And I told the guys what I had gone through in the bed just moments ago. And I cried like a baby. And this is one of the things a lot of people don't realize about the military. Crying is just fine. Those guys kept me safe, not just physically, they made me feel safe. And I felt totally comfortable telling them what I was going through and how I felt. Eventually, the security cordon came up and they led us out to the plane. We would be the only three passengers aboard this plane other than the crew. What I didn't tell you is the reason the flight was redirected is because we would be carrying home the fallen soldier for whom they just had the ceremony. 
the army brought the flag draped casket on, on board. All the Air Force crew stood in a line at perfect attention. I'm a civilian, I put my hand on my heart. I felt kind of stupid. So I stood at attention with the Air Force crew as the army laid the casket in the middle of the aircraft. They all did a very slow eight count salute. They marched off the plane, and we watched them hugging and crying as they walked away. The crew got to work strapping this precious cargo down. We then had a nine and a half hour overnight flight back to Germany, where I slept right next to this casket. On every other plane I went on, we talked, we joked. Barely a word was spoke, spoken in nearly 10 hours. On every other flight, I visited the cockpit and hung out with the crew. I didn't visit the cockpit once. And I will tell you, it was one of the greatest honors of my life. Having just gone through this incredibly strange experience on the ground, I had the honor of bringing home somebody who understands service much deeper than I will ever understand it. Serve those who serve others, and you will live a life of joy and fulfillment.